Hello Ogleby Sea Church. We're continuing our series on what the Bible is all about in these Bible studies. We've already seen that the Bible is all about God and we saw last week that the Bible is all about sin and this week it's that the Bible is all about Jesus. And you might be thinking, well, haven't we already covered that in the first week? Well, the purpose of the first study, when we said the Bible is all about God, we were thinking of how the Bible is first and foremost not about some ancient belief system or ancient culture. It's about God. It's God's word. And it's not him just telling us what we need to do, do this, do that. He's revealing himself to us. But we didn't really get a chance to dive into who God is, this great God that we're introduced to and how we get to know him. And that's what I want to focus on now. The Bible insists that the only explanation of who God is, is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Outside of Jesus, there is no knowledge of God. He says, in fact, emphatically, that he is the way. He is the only way for us to know God. So here's a question for you. Hopefully you've got a pen and paper ready to write down. You don't need to share your answers with me. This is just for you to process what we're going through. But I want you to write down on a piece of paper your definition of God. What is God? Who is God? Now you can pause the video and spend a couple of minutes uh, writing your definition out. But I probably gave the game away too soon when I said it's, it's all about Jesus. He has to be our starting point. Maybe you've written down something brilliant like... God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Or maybe you've written something like God is a super being who is all powerful, all knowing, everywhere present, all good, that kind of thing. Or you might have used fancy language like om omnipresent or uh, omniscient or omnipotent, those kind of things. But there would be some truth in that, but there's a danger if we start there. And the danger is that we have our preconceived ideas of what God is and then expect Jesus to match that idea. But that's not going to really work, is it? Jesus doesn't fit into our categories so neatly like that. It's a bit like if I asked you to make a case for my, my peerless. And you might assume that my peerless is my phone. So you'd make me a small kind of plastic case for my what you guess is my peerless. Or you might guess that my peerless is a cat. So you'd make some kind of cage. But it turns out that my peerless is one of my precious guitars. And if I was going to use the phone-sized case for my guitar, or the cage, a cat-sized cage for my guitar, then I have to have to do some serious damage to my guitar to make it fit into that case. And it's the same kind of danger as we come to Jesus. If we have our pre- conceived ideas of what it means to be God, we can't expect Jesus to match those ideas. And the whole Bible explains who God is by showing us Jesus over and over again in wonderful ways. And obviously there's so much to cover in the study, we can't deal with it all, so we're going to limit what we look at to the Gospel according to John. And as we take a survey of some of the deep things found in John, I won't get a chance to say too much on everything, but please pause the video at times when you want to do a bit more thinking and chew over what, we're, uh, over what I'm saying in the days to come. But firstly, John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Already that blows apart all of our pre-existing ideas of what it means to be God because we see that there's multiple persons in who God is. There's this one who's called the Word, who is God, but he was with God in the beginning. And Jesus, Jesus is described, he's called the Word of God. He's the one who makes God known. And he's not just a word from God, he is the word from God, unique in this role of making God known. Now, this name, this title of the word of God or the word of the Lord doesn't start in John chapter 1, verse 1. Actually, it's found in the Old Testament as well. So famously in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham, Abraham sees this person who is called the word of the Lord. And he speaks as the Lord. He is the Lord, but he's called the word of the Lord. And Abraham sees him and the word of the Lord she tells Abraham great promises and shows him the stars. You know the story. But the word of the Lord also speaks to the prophets throughout the Old Testament. Jonah, for instance, meets the word of the Lord. 
And the word word here in John chapter 1 verse 1 is the Greek word logos. And that's where we get the word logic from. So you can see how Jesus is the logic of God. He is the one who makes sense of God for us. Moving on then, John chapter 1 verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Let's start with that striking first phrase. No one has ever seen God. So get your pen and pencil ready. A pen and paper ready again. I want you to write down all the people that we read of in the Old Testament who did see God. Pause the video if you need to, but you could write down people like Adam and Eve, they saw the Lord. Abraham or Abraham, as we said earlier, Sarah, Hagar. Hagar says something wonderful. She says, I've now seen the one who sees me. There's also Jacob, there's Moses, there's Joshua, Manoah and his wife in the book of Judges, there's Isaiah, there's Ezekiel, many of the prophets. They all saw the Lord. But how can that be? How can John write, no one has ever seen God, when we read of in the Old Testament, so many people did see God. Well, who did they see? They saw the word of the Lord, the word of God, Jesus, who we call Jesus, because he's always been making God known. And one example of this is John chapter 12, verse 41 which says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Isaiah saw Jesus' glory. He saw Jesus. Think of Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah sees the Lord in his majestic splendour in the train of his robe, fills the whole temple, and there's these angelic beings crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He saw the Lord he must be seeing the Son of God, Jesus. And John chapter 4, verse 25 to 26 says, the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The original Greek has Jesus say there, I, the one speaking to you, I am. And that is huge. That's amazing. We'll come back to the great I am statements in John in a little while. But let's deal with this title of Christ or Messiah, because Jesus claims that for himself, saying, I am the Christ. So get your pen and paper ready. Pause the video if needed and write down what it means to be the Christ. Often Christ is simplified to mean God's promised king. And yeah, that's kind of true, but there's so much more to it than just that. It means anointed one, and anointed is to have something poured on your head. That's what it is to be anointed. And in the Old Testament, kings were anointed with oil, as were the prophets, but the ones who were really anointed, drenched with oil, were the priests. It was like the ice bucket challenge, but think not with water, but with Bertoli. They are anointed ones, and that's what it means to be the Christ. And they were Christ with little C's. But Jesus is the Christ. He is the anointed one, not just merely anointed with oil, but full to the brim and overflowing without measure of the Holy Spirit. That's what we see in John chapter 3, verse 34. That's why Jesus is the Christ. You could also think about how Jesus is called the Word of God and the Spirit is the breath of God and how that relates to each other. All that the Word of God does is empowered by the breath of God. And Jesus pointed out, that the Old Testament promised that the Christ would be God himself. You'd have to go out to Mark, uh, out of John to see that. You can see that in Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 and 45. Jesus is saying, how can the Christ be the son of David? When David himself called the Messiah, my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord. So he's the son of God. That's what the point is there. Anyway, moving on, John chapter 5, verse 46 says, Jesus says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. According to Jesus elsewhere, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Jesus confirms that. And Jesus is saying here that all that Moses wrote is about him. It's about Jesus. A similar passage to this is Luke chapter 24, verses 
uh, verse 27 and also verses 44 to 47 in these wonderful passages where Jesus is giving amazing Bible studies. He says that not just the first five books of the Bible are about him, but in fact the whole of the Old Testament is all about him. In the children's Bible that I'm reading with my girls before their bedtime, we've just finished the Old Testament and moved on to the New Testament. And I've been asking Megan, what's the Old Testament about? And she excitedly says, Jesus. And I say, so what's the New Testament about? And she says even more enthusiastically, Jesus. And she gets it. It's all about Jesus. Sometimes, think, sometimes people think that there are two different gods that we're introduced to through the Bible. There's this nasty God of the Old Testament and a nice God in the New Testament, but that's a load of nonsense. The Bible clearly teaches that there is one God who is shown to us only through Jesus. It's Jesus in the Old Testament and it's Jesus in the New Testament. He reveals the Father and the Spirit. So how's the Old Testament about Jesus then? That might be a question in our minds. Well, there are three ways, and they're all P's, so it's easy to understand. Firstly, Jesus is promised in the Old Testament, and we're not going to read it now, but you could turn to John chapter 19, verses 33 to 37, to see that. That's the crucifixion of Jesus. And John, who writes the Gospel according to John, draws out how there's so many promises in the Old Testament that have their fulfilment in Jesus and what he's done for us. Also, Jesus is pictured for us in the Old Testament. One example in John's Gospel is John chapter 1, verse 29, where John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, Look, the Lamb of God who bears away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God. So we see in the Old Testament all the pictures of the sacrificial system, the lambs that were sacrificed. They're all pointing towards and picturing in a little way who Jesus is and what he'd come to do. But thirdly, Jesus is present in the Old Testament. Now you might be more familiar with how Jesus is promised and pictured in the Old Testament, but I find it the most exciting to think that Jesus is present there because Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. It's not as if he was up in heaven twiddling his thumbs, waiting to be born of Mary and come into this world as a human being, and he had nothing to do before then. No, Jesus has always been the word of God. He's always been active. He's always been speaking for God and revealing who God is all the way through the Bible. He shows up all the way through the Old Testament because he is the God of the Old Testament. The wonderful I am statements throughout John make this crystal clear. Now, I know that you as a church have gone through the I am statements in John over the summer months, so we're not going to go over them all again now. But let me just read one of them to you. This is John chapter 8, verse uh, 56 to 57. And Jesus is speaking to some of the Jews. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. They picked up stones and were about to kill him because they understood what Jesus was claiming. He was claiming to be the God of the Old Testament, and they thought it was blasphemy, but in actual fact, it was true. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, the I Am. And I should explain that the Old Testament personal name of God is Yahweh in the Hebrew. And what that means, basically, is I Am. It's God's personal name. And that's a name that Jesus claims for himself. In most uh, translations in the Old Testament, it's put as Lord in capital letters. And I'm not going to go into why that is now. But the point is, Jesus is Lord in all capitals. Jesus is Lord. He is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, and all the rest. There is so much more that could and should be said on this, but I've gone on far too long already. Let me just say that as I preach through the Old Testament, expect me to show you Jesus, how he's there through it all, how he's promised, how he's pictured, and how he is present throughout it. And as I preach through the New Testament as well, it's all about Jesus, of course. So expect me to lift him up. Also, let your hearts be comforted in the sure knowledge that Jesus is God. He fully reveals God to us. He is the, the embodiment of divinity to us. 
So we're not to think that there's anything nasty or sinister lurking behind Jesus that we're not aware of. No, Jesus gives it all to us. He is the explanation of God. There's no knowledge of God outside of him, but we come to God and have the fullness of God in him. So Jesus could say to Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And as we look at Jesus, we see such a wonderful God. We see a God who is gracious and compassionate, patient, who is abounding in love, who is humble, who is eager to bless, who's available, who's always got time for us. His character is the same character of the Spirit who's given to us, who helps us each day. Praise the Lord that we have such a God. And finally then, let me say this. If you miss Jesus, you miss the point. It's true of reading the Bible, and it's ultimately true in life. If you miss Jesus, you miss the point entirely. In John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31, John tells us why he wrote this book, which is all about Jesus. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. In fact, the whole Bible is about Jesus, so that we would be able to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name.